Hi, I'm Byron Nelson from CancerVax, and this is another episode of Cancer Stories. Today, we're talking to Chris Westerkamp from Providence, Rhode Island. Chris, uh, thanks for joining me this morning. Oh, you're welcome. Good to, good to see you. So in terms of full transparency, I should tell you that Chris is a dear friend of mine. We've been friends for many, many years and have a lot in common. We um, actually uh, had long careers in the broadcasting business, specifically television, and met, I think the first time I met you, Chris, was in San Francisco when you were at KPIX. Would that Correct. be correct? Yeah, about 40 years ago. Yeah, I mean, it's just kind of hard <laughs> to imagine. You were working and, for, for my friend Phil. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Anyway, Chris and I have had a, a a great friendship and have a lot in common, not the least of which is that we're both cancer survivors, which is the reason we're talking today. And so, Chris, I'd love to hear from you. Um, and I think the, uh, the, uh, the, the difference between our two stories, I mean, the similarities and the differences are quite striking. One, we both had uh, pancreatic cancer. Two, we're both survivors, um, but you had yours a long time ago. I'm going to guess like 20 years. Yeah, yeah, 2004. 2004, and, and mine was more recent. So yeah. the difference in the two experiences, I think, uh, quite informative. Um, and as we <clears throat> think about how cancer is being treated today, some of the remarkable work that's being done outside of the traditional ways of treating cancer, which, as you know, is surgery, which you and I both had. Mm -hmm. chemotherapy, which neither one of us had, and radiation, which, of course, I had. And so now there's some wonderful work being done uh, with cancer vaccines, um, including CancerVax and our relationship with UCLA. <clears throat> so let's go back in time. Um, 20 years ago, you're living where? Springfield, Mass. Springfield. I just moved there in 2003 in the fall and um running a tv station and um basically by myself i you know didn't have any family or anything in the area well I, my son lives in uh, connecticut so that was one of the my motivations for taking the job is uh, put me within an you know an hour of drive of uh, seeing my son who was 11 at the time so that was great and um so I was there, you know, with another fixer upper TV station, <clears throat> trying to get it, uh, you know, more profitable and better ratings and, you know, the drill on that. Um, and so I was doing fine. Then um, what happened was I was finding out that I couldn't sit in a staff meeting <clears throat> for more than half an hour without having to go to the bathroom. So that was a little bit weird, and I have made an appointment with a local doctor, and then he said, eh, we'll send you upstairs to, uh, you know, the, uh, the specialist, and it was on two floors up, and that was the beginning of me finding out that I, that I had prostate cancer. So that was pretty, pretty you know, an extra thing that I had just not, you know, imagined that yeah. uh, I would deal with given all the adjustments I was making in my life at the time. And was it uh, the results of a blood test that uh, showed that you had the prostate cancer? Yeah. And of course, then, you know, you get a biopsy, which, you know, is that that is the like the least fun thing. <clears throat> it's, it just that was just a horrible process as far as I was concerned but um, yeah I was I was judging a, a cooking contest from a local school where they I think they had five or six students and I was with a um, guy that owned one of the restaurants in 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 town and, um, you know, I was probably between the fourth and fifth student tasting the food and I, my phone rang and it was my, my, uh, you know, my doctor. And he said, yeah, well, the 
the biopsy was positive. And I thought, this is really weird, you know, to think that I'm in the middle of all this and I, I couldn't absorb what all what it all meant, you know, because it was all new territory and I hadn't really had much experience with people who who had it to find out, you know, what the story was. But there you go. And it took a while to um, process that. And then I have a, a niece who's married to a, a very uh, a specialist, a cancer specialist. And they, they live in Chicago. I called him up and he said, well, you're a young guy. You know, get it taken out and don't fool around with it. And um, so I did. So at, at that time, and, and so the recommendation was, let's take it up. So surgery. Yeah, surgery. And But was there any conversation back then about, uh, has it spread? Uh, is there a way for us to tell the spread? We hope that it's all contained in your prostate. And if we take it out, she'll be okay. I mean, what were the uncertainties back 20 years ago that maybe don't exist today? Yeah. Yeah, and you know, <clears throat> I opted. I really liked the doctor that I had. Uh, he uh, came from India, and a weird thing happened along the way when we scheduled the the surgery. Um, when we were coming up to the date, I got a call from him, and he said, "Look, you know, my mother died." And I have to go back to India for a couple of weeks. And it didn't seem like my cancer was particularly aggressive. And, you know, so I said, fine, you know, because he said, you know, you can have the option. We could always get you another surgeon and blah, 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 blah. So I, but I didn't, I said, no, I felt comfortable with this guy. Well, it turns out that <clears throat> my, my Gleason number was fairly low when you know when, when we had the biopsy but by the time that he got back from india which was a couple of weeks it shot up very fast and i didn't even know that until you know they didn't find out when they do the surgery and i thought back on it and i thought that was probably a mistake to wait and uh but nonetheless, you know, he got it all out, and and that was, and it, you know, it was a good outcome. And um, back then, uh, no robotics, right? I mean, it was just him. No, there were robotics. I just oh, he he, actually he was did. an old fashioned surgeon, you know, by comparison. Because a lot of people said, well, you know, go to Boston, find a robotic guy, you know, um, more precise. Yeah, etc. But um, <laughs> you know. Uh, I had a couple of other people that around that time that, that got at one of my anchor people and my secretary's husband and my accounting manager's husband. It was weird that, you know, the amount of people that were getting cancer and prostate cancer. So um, in any event, you know, I was lucky that, uh, you know, because people were dying who had a Gleason number of, of seven jerry orbach from law and order that's right yeah he he died of it he was he happens to um i happen to have a really good friend who was a producer of that show for 14 years um and they were good friends and he said it was just you know a tragedy for uh for him and for obviously orbach do you, do you remember if he had the surgery <laughs> I think he did, yeah. So even even with the surgery, uh, he yeah. got it. So, do you remember how? Do you remember how long your procedure was? I mean, you went in, they knocked you out. Well, I know that I went in, and it was a you know a fairly quick operation. Um, I think it was four or five hours. I think, which I think is standard. And then I was out of work for five or six weeks and um you know and then i was back at work and it was like moving on you know i looked at this as you know i've seen I, 
here's the irony of it. I was on the board of the American Cancer Society, this the the Western Mass chapter. And uh, you know, you when you're running a small TV station, you know, a lot of people want you on their these nonprofits want you to be serve on their boards. And I probably was on four or five. Um, but there I was, you know, you know, with the American Cancer Society and a year later after my operation, I had to do a speech at a meeting at a big, they had some annual dinner or something. And I said, uh, for the first time, I acknowledged that I was a cancer survivor. Wow. And, you know, at the time, uh, my, my then wife told me, you know, you've never said that. <laughs> I just didn't say it. I, I pretended like nothing happened. Yeah. And when I was going and, you know, waiting for the operation, I was sanguine about it. I just didn't think about it. I said, you know, we'll get this. And it turns out, you know, like for me, it was kind of like a root canal, you know, yeah. other people have had so much more trauma and illness and about, you know, around cancer that, I didn't experience, yeah. you know, I, I was like, I dodged a bullet in many ways and, and mentally I just kept trucking along, you know, so. Well, as you know, and we talked about this earlier, if you're a man, uh, there's yeah. a very good chance you, you, you're either going to get it or you have it. The question is, uh, will it kill you? <laughs> right. Right. That, uh, they had done autopsies on uh, uh, after wars of young men from all over the world. And most of them had some form of pancreatic cancer, right? So, yeah. Uh, and it's interesting. And so so after that, you, you know, you do you still have your blood tested to, to check it? Or are you pretty much? You know, uh, it's funny. I didn't have it tested for maybe 12 years. And my primary physician said when's the last time we tested your for your PSA and I said I haven't I mean I got it out it's gone it was zero I didn't think about it anymore yeah. and he said well, we better test it and, and it came back zero again which is good you know um so I'm lucky you know my yeah. my brother has it you know my older brother um I just currently know. has it pardon currently has it yes he's he had a you know a similar situation that you had and um and, and he hasn't been able to you know completely get rid of it he's not so he keeps getting he had that extended long five days a week um radiation radiation and uh you know he's a Otherwise, in good shape, he still swims all the time. He was a swimmer. And, um, you know, I check in with him all the time to see how he's doing. So he's yeah, not. Well, the, the, the one thing you learned, and you and I both learned, was how prevalent it is, number one, and how insidious it is. I think I, I mentioned to you, I, I had mine out. Um, yeah, and they had me on Lupron, which takes your testosterone level to zero and, you know, really trying to squelch uh, everything. <clears throat> and uh, then had my blood done three months later. And yeah. it was interesting. I, you know, t today, of course, you, you get the results uh, in an email before you even talk to your doctor. And my PSA came back uh, 0 0.01. So it went from 14 to 0 0.01. And I thought, fantastic, right? I mean, that's like yeah. nothing. And I was really intrigued by the reaction of my doctor, who was quite disappointed. And I said, well, geez, 0 0.01, that's nothing. And he goes, but it's something, right? And then you realize how insidious cancer is and how quickly it can turn on you. So if there's even a little bit, you can monitor it and nothing. And then all of a sudden, it can start to, you're, you're, as one of my colleagues says, you know, cancer makes your body go crazy. And yeah. all of a sudden, you know, a month later, you've, you know, it's back up to wherever and it's, it's spread and whatnot. So <clears throat> I had the radiation and then currently uh, undetectable, which is great. In terms of your finances and whatnot, your, your, uh, um, 
insurance covered everything that was not a yeah an issue for you financially, which, as you know, for some people is not the case. Right. I know. You know, and I had uh, some I had one short period where I wasn't uh, covered by insurance and I got tonsillitis and it was, you know, by the time I was done, it was like a, you know, $12,000 bill. Yeah. Crazy. You know, and, and you just realize, you know, that's a whole other topic about our. Yeah, I was going to say healthcare. We'll, we'll save that for another episode. Yeah. Another time. yeah. I think it's, yeah. I think it's fascinating for you and I to be here today in 2023 talking about a 20 year old cancer experience and, you know, a three or four year cancer experience, how far they've come. But still, as we sit here today, the traditional forms of, of ways of treating cancer are surgery, mm -hmm. chemotherapy, and radiation. I had two of those. You had one of them. Yeah. And, of course, the, the, the real tough one is the chemotherapy, which would have been the recommendation had my radiation not worked. And, right. you know, in its simplest form, and neither, neither one of us are doctors, but in its simplest form, you know, chemo goes in. We, we we understand the the uh, characteristics and the markers that the cancer cells exhibit, and it kills them. But mm -hmm. the same characteristics that exist in healthy cells, and so yeah. in the process they kill a bunch of healthy stuff, and you lose your hair and your skin turns yellow, and you know it's it's yeah. it's awful. So it's encouraging that there's so much extraordinary work being done, um, particularly in the area of, of vaccines. And as you and I have discussed, uh, the particular work that we're supporting with our friends at UCLA is a, uh, a detect, mark, and kill strategy, which detects the cancer in the cells, marks it, and even encourages the cancer cells to exhibit certain very unique markers that do not exist in healthy cells. And then mm -hmm. the opportunity to go in and destroy those particular cells, leaving everything else alone. Uh, yeah. a, a remarkable um, um, idea, a lot of people working on it. Let's hope that it's uh, going to be successful. I actually reported recently on some good results uh, on pancreatic cancer, which is, you know, <clears throat> you get pancreatic cancer, your, your days are numbered one way or the other, right? Yeah, it's uh, tough. Prostate, much higher uh, incidence <clears throat> of survival. So, a lot of work going on. It takes a lot of money, a lot of support, a lot of work. This is all preclinical in our case. And so it's, uh, for me, there's, there's a personal interest in all this and obviously for people, my friends and people I know. So uh, thank you very much for uh, sharing your story with us. Delighted that you're, you can uh, enthusiastically talk about yourself as a cancer survivor. If yeah. you were to give anybody any advice, um, what would it be? You've got a son. Uh, have you had this conversation with him? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And he, uh, he works in the medical field now. So he's very, very aware of uh, a, a lot of things in medicine that uh, he wasn't when he was a chef, a pastry chef. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, I don't know about the advice. You just have, it's a real uh, mental challenge. You know, it's you have to sort of control your emotions and your your attitude about it. I think is a huge part of the of being successful. Yeah. You know, with a better outcome. And um, I was I was in denial, so that <laughs> that was a strange way to to deal with it. But I I just carp you know compartmentalized it and put it aside and then you know it was uh, unnerving to people around me they're saying why aren't you war worried about this and i just said yeah. well, being worried about it's not going to do anything no so that was well, that. good advice yeah, yeah stay on top of it and and thanks for sharing your story you know so much uh, great work being done around the world that deserves our best efforts and our our support uh, for more information about what CancerVax is doing specifically in developing a universal cancer vaccine, come and visit us at cancervax.com. Thanks again for being with us, Chris. Okay. Take care, Byron.